This is Cantus Firmus, Kingdom Theology for Christians Without a Country. Greetings, you are listening to and or watching Cantus Firmus. My name is Cody Cook, and uh, my guest today is Kerry Baldwin, and I'm trying something new. I've got a co-host. So here he is, the Andy Richter to my Conan, the Ed McMahon to my Johnny Carson, the George Fenneman to my Groucho Marx. John D'Angelo, the anti-war war vet. Mm. Okay, so here's the thing, man. I um I hate uh, podcasts with pre-show co-host banter, uh, but I'm gonna oh, I want to try it anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, like the man who's been divorced four times before. I think this time it might actually work. Um, so let's uh, let's chat a little well, bit. What do you uh, What have you been up to? Well, man? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm uh, still not divorced, which uh, is just thanks to the grace of God, amazing of God and my wife. Um, but when you think about it, like this time, it just might work as far as the divorces go. I mean, it's true because you'll just die. Like maybe this podcast, if we don't nail this, um, in which case it did work. Is it, am I bantering? I, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not, I'm not good at bantering. So I, I've always been one of those people that when people like want to talk about sports or the weather or something, I, I have like, I freeze up. I've, I've got nothing to contribute. Yeah. And the worst so I'm not, of all time. Yeah, yeah, I always want to try to bring it to, you know, abortion. The, the abortion or the, uh, you know, non-aggression principle or something. Um, how many kids do you have right now, John? Because I can't keep track of all your kids. Yeah, I have um, I have three kids currently, and um, I have instituted a, a strict no urine pregnancy test rule in the house. So we'll never know when the next one's coming until my wife is showing. Uh, which is nice. Does that apply to your wife or, as well, or just oh, to yeah, your? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a r- radical cessation house wide. I, I check the okay. cabinets every day. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you've got three, and who knows, maybe another one on the way. Cody, have I ever told you that my mom would curse me? I was a terrible child, and my mom would curse me on a regular basis that I would have five kids just like me. <laughs> and I have five boys just like me. And I have three boys. Yeah just like me and my wife is adamant that we do yeah. four just one more just one more and i can't stop like waking up in cold sweats thinking about twin boys oh just yeah finishing it off like my mom some weight like haitian witch doctor just hexed me yeah I- i'm gonna bleep this there, there's there is a i used to listen to this american life a lot on npr mm. oh you and better there was, bleep a, that. there was a guy npr yeah. loser <laughs> Yeah, that, that was before everything was about, um, you know, trying to figure out how they could bring around Ibram X. Kendi. But um, um, the, uh, the, the, there was a bit where somebody was talking about this friend of theirs they used to see all the time, and then he had twins, and then, like, they didn't see him for months. And um, and so they went to go, like, talk to his buddy, and he, he made it, like, a part of the show, you know. And the guy said, you know, they, they call it having twins, but they shouldn't call it having twins. They should call it having two f***ing babies at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um Anyway, yeah, so I've, I've got three, which um, somebody who's who's a faithful listener to the podcast, that there might be a couple, um, would, will know that, that, I had, that I had two at least, but I don't know if they know I had three because we kept that one more quiet. Yeah, well, Mazel um, Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was actually, um, the pregnancy was, you know, my, my wife was ready to have the baby. It wasn't, like, terribly rough, but, you know. But the, the, the birth itself was so easy. And it was like in, within a couple hours, right? She had the baby. Um, and so everything was looking good. It was running smoothly. And then he gets stuck on the way out. And I don't think, I don't know if I told you this. Me? No, I did. I did. Yeah. I did. I messaged you about it. Yeah, we're chatting. yeah, he yeah. gets, he gets stuck on the way out. And um, um, he like, he, he, he was like doing, it was like, it was like a Jack Benny move. You know, he just was like this. And um, he like got sort of stuck coming out because his arm was there. And um, I mean, they had to like, you know, they brought right on like nurses to like kind of, you know, push back on the leg and help him pull and stuff. And so this kid comes out blue and I'm like, I don't think that's the color they're supposed to come out, but I don't know. And they're just like being quiet, you know? So I really don't know. Like they're not like freaking out, but they're not like, well, we'll have muscle top or anything. So, um, uh, and then like they bring him over to like put him in this, um, you know, the thing they put him in the weird plastic thing. That's really uncomfortable, but the baby screams all the whole time. Um, and they keep doing this thing. They lift up his arms and legs to see, you know, I guess I didn't really know what they were doing, but they kept lifting up his arms and legs and they would just flop right down. Mm. And I guess what they were checking for, I found out later was a startle response. Mm-hmm. He didn't have this, 
um, you know, instinctual, um, you know, reflexive startle response. So anyway, you know, we don't know what's going on, basically. It's just, you can tell that something's up, something's weird. And um, so it was really frightening. And then um, they didn't want to tell us what was going on, but they, they used the word, they said they talked about using a certain kind of cooling blanket or whatever. They, they were saying we were on a transfer to another hospital because, you know, they've got a better NICU or whatever. Um, and so I look up the cooling blanket thing and then I figure out, okay, this is something they give to a baby when uh, they're concerned about your brain damage. Yeah. Right. I'm like, oh, they, no. they, didn't, they didn't explain any of that. Not at first, they, but they use that word. And then they also, this nurse also used the word floppy, which I didn't Google because I didn't assume it was a medical term. Um, but my dad did, and he like got the whole thing about what that actually can mean. Um, and so, yeah, so it was really scary. But um, within like a couple, like a couple hours later, they like they were like, okay, we're going to transfer him, but we'll let you see him or whatever. And then we're like, we're waiting, we're waiting, and um, they'll come back and give a little update every now and then. And they're like, oh well, you know, he's starting to respond a little bit more, but you know, not as much as we want to see at this point. You know, we would expect a little bit more. Um. And so anyway, yeah, I actually, I actually asked the nurse about it. I was like, yeah, I looked up this cooling blanket thing. Your concern is this, right? Because it's like, they don't want to tell you what they're concerned about because they're worried they're going to stress you out. But then what happens is you, when you don't know what to worry about, you worry about everything. Right. Right. So it's like, um, so anyway, then it's, of course, the prayer is, you know, you know, God, you know, let him, you know, not have you know, these severe, you know, let him not have these kind of, you know, brain problems or whatever. And then it's like, if he does, I pray that they're not severe. And if they are severe, I just pray that he's alive. You know what I mean? It's like, you kind of do this like negotiation thing with your prayer. Um, and, um, yeah. but yeah, man, so he's, he's doing really well now. Um, he smiles a lot now. He's kind of at that stage. Um, he was born like a month early. So he's like two months and some change. Actually, he's getting, actually he's getting a bit close to three months. He's been smiling for a while now, uh, you know, much more responsive. He sleeps a lot and fusses a lot and eats a lot. But um, I think that's pretty normal. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So that's we're we're very relieved. And it's our first yeah. boy. Um, so, you know, which I don't really care that much. But I thought it would be fun for a change. Um, and my wife is like, you know, I've only had girls. I don't know if I'm going to be able to bond with a boy. And then like, you know, and she was like, I was stupid. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, she's bonded obviously. Dude, with he's going to like only have eyes for her. It's crazy. My, if I get my, the baby up from naps, he's immediate, he's like eight months now. So he's like, you know, more mobile. He's like crawling out of my arms, jerking his head around, looking for her. Like where is she? Where is she? She's where's where's the lady? Where's my mom? It's, Aww. it's nuts. Yeah, it's the boy. The boy and mom thing is cool, and it it it's the only the potential inverse connection that I would have with the daughter is the only like selling point I imagine for having a girl because the stakes just seem so high, like it's scary to think about. Oh, you're you're like worried about like you know her getting older, like having a like a you know douchey boyfriend or something well, i mean the... like no um just I, I i boil it down to this pithy line that like i can make my boys or like do everything i can to make my boys good men but i can't do that for every other man that you know mm -hmm. the candidates uh, in courtship and sure just look at the, um yeah when we were growing up, remember how like the war of the sexes was like a thing? Like it was like, I don't know, it was a TV show or what, but it was just like talked about. I remember hearing the term several times. Mm -hmm. Battle of the sexes. Battle of the sexes. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And um, as I've gotten older, I've realized like women have just unequivocally lost. If you think in just strict male and female terms, like like sex is so casual and so noncommittal and and like. I just, I worry about, I would worry, I, I'm saying this to a guy with daughters, as I have not, I'm, these are just my internal dialogues, like, I don't know, I stress out about that, like, I want to get sucked into that world, and I don't want to, like, shelter her, because then she'll, I don't know, she'll become a stripper yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, my, my daughters are pretty young yet, but it's, it's working out pretty well. I mean, uh, <laughs> the... Um, our, our, our second daughter, um, did have that kind of thing where she just was very attached to me, like from very early on. Um, and that's, that's mellowed out a little bit. So like my wife doesn't feel like, you know, crappy all the time. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, it like really bothered her um, that, you know, I- Ivy, our second daughter was just very hyper focused on me. Um, she's still like, if, if she somehow knows when I'm about to leave the house, um, you know, I can get up from like the chair or whatever, like 50 times, but the one time I'm actually getting up to like leave, she like knows and she like runs and gets her shoes and, you know, just like, locks the door. Yeah. She, it's anytime I go somewhere, she, she wants to go with me. So, um, it's, it's pretty cool though. I, I think it, it could be, I hope you have a daughter cause I think it would be neat. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm open to whatever, but it's funny as you were saying that yeah. she notices that you're getting up. I had the same sort of thing had, had struck me with my kids that I'll do something really, um, what to my mind, like it doesn't, doesn't register, but like I'll put my, I don't carry my keys unless I'm going out, but I put them on my belt and I usually do it in my bedroom and I'm usually doing that without anyone around, but the sound of the keys must like catch their ear. And it struck me just this like just recently in the last month or so that like their entire world, everything they've ever observed is like this stupid little house. Like they, they don't know anything. Yeah. Else. So like they're hyper focused on the routines and stuff. It's like these little things that I wouldn't notice. And yeah, they're catching me like leaving without me having said it or whatever. Yeah, man, they're cool. It's cool doing the parenthood thing. It's just, you seem like you're probably more patient than I am. I'm not a, I'm not a, super patient. I don't know. Head. I don't know. I try to be. Um, I don't know. I I, I struggle sometimes. I, I've, I've gotten more patient, I think, with time. Mm. I will say that. Yeah. Um, it, it helps that... Uh, 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 what's that? Your oldest is 10? Uh, just about, yeah, you're going to be going to be 10 next month. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um... Well, speaking of kids and how great they are, uh, do you want to talk to Carrie Baldwin uh, about the uh, sort of anarchist arguments for abortion? Yes. Yeah. I'm or, sorry, against abortion, not for abortion, yeah. against abortion. You ready to do that, Sean? I am. I um, I don't know why I, my my brain got so dark there, but um, I thought you were going to make a terrible joke, and instead you. You rounded it out to just the logical conclusion that kids are great and therefore we I did a segue. abortion. Thank you, Carrie Baldwin, for all your yeah. Good work. But yeah, let's do that. Let's talk to Carrie because I'm I'm not very useful at the moment as a co-host. Okay. Well, you're going to be here with, with us through the conversation, so I, just, <laughs> I hope you'll be a little useful. Yeah. Don't. All right. All right, John. We're going to talk to Carrie. All right. All right. Carrie Baldwin is an independent researcher and writer with a BA in philosophy from Arizona State University. She's a Christian anarchist who's been featured on John Stossel TV, The Bob Murphy Show, but not The Tom Woods Show, is a regular contributor at the Libertarian Christian Institute, and her website is mereliberty.com. She's also in the process of formalizing her work into a theory proposal for peer review. Anyone interested in seeing this work come to fruition can support that through monthly membership at mereliberty.com slash membership. And I'm excited to talk with her about abortion as both an ethical issue and a political one, both from a Christian anarchist perspective. So thank you, Carrie, for taking time to talk with us. Thanks, Cody, for that great introduction. <laughs> You're so welcome. Uh, anyway, but before, uh, before we, uh, we started recording, we were uh, John had asked Carrie if she'd been on Tom Woods because he seemed to remember her being on there. And apparently that is not the case, which is a shame. But... Uh, okay, so Carrie, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, background, particularly as it's relevant to the abortion debate? Oh, that's a fun one. Um, I actually grew up uh, with my parents pretty active with Right to Life. And so I distinctly remember sitting at the dining room table, stuffing envelopes for Right to Life. Um, I even went to a handful of protests. I remember one protest um, on the University of New Mexico campus, and we were out there holding signs. Um, And I just remember, gosh, I must have been maybe seven or eight. And I remember this one woman driving by and she had this huge smile on her face, like very friendly smile. And I noticed that she was flipping me off. (laughs) Um, And I just remember thinking to myself, that's so weird that somebody would object to this message. Um, Anyways, 
I so I was I was pretty well steeped in the pro life movement. Um, did you know some some speech and debate stuff in the public school where I took a pro life stance? It actually uh, went better than you might expect. Um, when I got into college, I actually had uh, decided to double major in medical lab science and political science, and my goal with that was to. Uh, become a genetic researcher and uh, do, uh, oh, what is it called? Cord blood stem cell research as an ethical alternative to embryonic stem cell research. Mm. So that was my like original plan. And uh, that ended up not coming to fruition. Uh, I did go into medical lab science, and uh, but I did that through the United States Air Force. Um, when I got out, <coughs> Um, I got out because I was pregnant, so I got out early, just shy of three years. Um, got out when I was eight months pregnant. And uh, then after my first son was born in February 2006, about three months later, I found out that I was pregnant again. <laughs> uh, surprise, surprise, with my daughter. And so I ended up um, just dropping out of school um, and going back to uh, or becoming a you know full time stay at home mom. Um, it was during that time I ended up um, in a uh, social media forum that now doesn't exist, or it doesn't exist as a as a social media forum. It was called Cafe Mom. It was basically like Facebook for for moms, and I was in some some abortion debate groups, and that was really the first time where. Uh, I was exposed to uh, different views about abortion. So not just stories about women who had had abortions and why they, why they had them, but I also interacted with all kinds of non-Christians who were pro-life. Uh, I distinctly remember meeting a, um, a Wiccan woman who was pro-life and found out that there are a ton of practicing pagan pro-lifers. And mm -hmm. that blew my mind. Um, but I think that the the biggest thing for me was hearing the stories about women who had gotten abortions. And uh, a lot of it had to do with things that I was experiencing in my own marriage, poverty, um, a bad relationship. I ended up divorcing in 2016 uh, for abuse. And... So at any rate, uh, but when I was in this, this forum, this was probably, I want to say about 2007, 2008. Um, once I started hearing those stories, I just basically shut up about the pro-life thing. Uh, I didn't, I was still, still felt like I was pro-life, but didn't feel like I had really a good answer because I could see that there was some complexity to it and it wasn't. Mm -hmm as simple as saying, oh, these women are just, you know, murderers who are trying to get away with, you know, uh, eschewing their responsibility for what, for, for things that had happened in their life. And so I looked at it very, very different, differently in 2015 or, or 16. Uh, I heard of an a movement called End Abortion Now, uh, which was sort of re trying to reinvigorate um, a staunch pro-life anti-abortion position. And uh, what I had heard from them was that they wanted to make abortion first degree murder. And mm. if the death penalty was available in a state, they were perfectly okay with that being a punishment for abortion. And I thought, whoa, no, <laughs> like I am pro-life. I don't want babies aborted. Um, but there is a serious disconnect. Um, yeah. I'm between... pro-life, but I'm not, I'm not also pro-death. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like, okay. Um, young life. yeah, well, you know, I, my first, one of my first, um, podcast episodes was, uh, titled, uh, how the how the pro-life movement is aborting a pro-life era. 
Hmm. And uh, I used a study from a pro-choice person, actually, from the University of Maryland who had studied the pro-life movement and just talked about the issues that, that were happening. There's, I think she described four streams, she, she called them, of the pro-life movement. They were disjointed, uh, wouldn't cooperate with one another. You know, so you've got the, the political stream and you've got the activist stream and you've got um, the, uh, what's it called? The crisis pregnancy centers, those people who are actually offering help. Um, and it was just really interesting to go through that information. And by that time, I was a libertarian. I had had some, you know, education in Austrian economic theory. And so when I revisited the abortion issue, I thought, oh, a lot of this, a lot of the reasons why women seek abortion has to do with economics. <laughs> and I was like, why don't we approach it from an economic standpoint? And of course, uh, when I, when I, published that episode. Um, I posted it in a reformed libertarian group and it was not well received because I was being critical of the pro-life movement saying, Hey, you guys, you guys have a problem with your messaging. You have a problem with your solutions. Um, you have, and it was, it was also a critique of this end abortion now movement, uh, which eventually became the, uh, abortion abolitionist movement. Uh, there's a statist version of that. And then there's an anarchist version of that. I don't, I don't have any problems with the anarchist version. Um, but yeah, it was not real well received. Shortly after that, I uh, did an episode explaining the fallacy of the Christian feminist view of abortion, which is essentially the safe, legal and rare argument. Uh, so I sort of tore that one apart. Um, but yeah, that's how I got. <laughs> that's how I got into, out of, and back into the abortion debate. Okay. So, um, yeah, and, and I'm really interested. Somebody who's listening may may not sense exactly where we're going with this when we talk about from an anarchist perspective. Um, it's going to be complicated if you're pro-life because most pro-lifers uh, are, are arguing for a state-based solution to mm -hmm. abortion, and so it's like, well, if you don't believe in the state, what's your solution to abortion? Right. Um, and so, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, maybe we'll, we'll talk about the ethics of the question first. And, but before we actually discuss the ethics, um, with some of the science and uh, medical background that you have, can you shed any light on whether the fetus is actually a human or just a clump of cells? Because I've yeah. heard tell from the, uh, believe the science crowd that a fetus is substantially the same as a sperm cell. So is there any truth to that? Oh, no. In fact, uh, the science for a very, very long time is was absolutely definitive in that uh, a new, unique human life began at conception. Um, now, I've qualified that a little bit when I when I speak about at conception, because conception isn't a moment. It takes about three days for it to mm -hmm. be completed. So I say that there is a unique a new unique living human from the moment conception is complete. That's how I phrase that. Um, but it's been uh, incontrovertible up until I would say maybe five years ago uh, when I don't know exactly who started it, but basically medical schools started trying to talk about the fetus in terms of being a cancer or being a parasite I mean, it was it was very obviously trying to rewrite what was yeah. uh, decidedly so for for such a long time. Now, I'm not a I'm not the kind of person who talks about settled science. I absolutely believe in testing, retesting, and challenging. Um, but there's not a good reason to think that the uh, that the conceptus, right, the zygote is not a human being. It, it, it's interesting how narrative, um, you, you understand how it could shape things like politics or philosophy, or, or I guess maybe even English departments or something. But yeah. it, it's weird how it starts to reshape things that we think of as more objective, like science and mathematics. And so mm -hmm. now we have to sort of attach these, these sort of evaluative judgments about, um, you know, who's oppressed and who's an oppressor and, and, you know, <laughs> um, it, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it's kind of bizarre, but, um, yeah. so, 
Okay, so the, 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 the science has been uh, universally or, or, or um, largely universal in its acceptance that, that uh, life begins at conception, conception. Now, they would say that this sort of new um, shift, are they denying that it's a human? Are they denying, what, what, what exactly is the, is it just that they're just giving a different evaluation of, of what this thing is? Um, so basically... What you had with Roe v. Wade was uh, the, oh, I forget his name, the justice who who wrote the majority opinion, Blackman or something like that. Um, yeah, but the, yeah, the, the, the majority decision, one of the things that it stated in there was if science could mm -hmm. prove that that was a human being, then the uh, fetus would be protected by the 19th, 19th Amendment. I shouldn't say human being. If the fetus could be proven to be a person, okay. then it would be considered, you know, it would be protected by the 19th Amendment or 14th, 19th. I'm getting my amendments confused. 14th, 19th is the women voting amendment. I Thank think. you. 14th yeah. Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the privileges speech. and immunities. Yeah. So <laughs> then the conversation switched to okay, is the fetus a person? And it was actually a philosopher by the name of Marianne Warren who suggested that the fetus is not a person and gave a philosophical argument as to why. Um, and the problem with her argument was that uh, her conditions for, uh, for, for personhood, if you applied them to living humans, there were certain living humans or born humans, I should say, um, certain born humans that wouldn't qualify as persons either. And so that was a major flaw with yes. her argument. But nonetheless, uh, pro-choice advocates gra grabbed a hold of it. And they're like, oh, fetus isn't a person. And, you know, maybe she was wrong about X, Y, and Z, but still fetus is not a person. And then you had the pro-life movement react to that and start trying to enact personhood laws, having the government mm. define personhood. Um, yeah. And so that was that was a bit of a problem. Yeah, because well, um, personhood is more of a hazy philosophical category, right? Whereas yeah. scientifically, we can speak with more definitive uh, definitiveness about what something is. Um, but personhood, is, person is not a scientific term, right? Right. It's a it's a personhood. What what makes us a person, a complete person, is a philosophical debate. We don't want the government defining that. Um, I actually have an article up on LCI about life versus personhood, and uh, I basically show how the Roe v. Wade court um, begged the question about personhood because they recognized the personhood of the pseudonym Roe, Jane Roe, mm -hmm as representing a real person, even though they couldn't see the, you know, that real person, she wasn't actually physically there. They didn't like Jane Roe was just, you know, it was just a stand in name. And in the decision, they acknowledged her personhood and then turned around and said, we can't acknowledge the personhood of the fetus because we don't know what personhood is. Mm. Okay. So that's, the kind of, the, the, I guess, the groundwork here. So we've... Can I, can I, I interject I, for just a sec? Yeah, go ahead. Carrie, I have this like 10,000 foot view of a, the abortion issue. I, I, I think I've taken a similar um, like waxing and waning intellectual approach to it because it's muddy. I work in healthcare. I've been an ER nurse for four years. I was an EMS before that. I've seen plenty of, um, you know, like pending miscarriages and difficult mm -hmm. uh, pregnancies and uh, bad pregnancies, botched abortions. Um, I appreciate that it's a really difficult topic uh, to wade into when you get into like the nitty gritty of the individual cases and um, they're not simple and it's it, there's right. nothing black and white about this issue. But um, the conversation about like the fundamentals has seemed to evolve with the political conversation and the um, the, the cultural, in my opinion, I, I've become more and more uh, interested in like this rightist argument about like cultural degradation or, or, or whatever, mm -hmm. like we've just lost the plot um, yeah. on, on whatever civilization's foundations are. And abortion seems to be a good um, litmus test for that because we see 
as you're talking about this this argument about like personhood like that's a huge shift in my lifetime my not only my lifetime but like my my cognizant period of time uh in my early 30s of like remembering safe legal and rare being a term of the clinton administration to uh, like laughing maniacally with ssri eyes about how like we know it's a baby and that's that's what makes it so great like it's mm-hmm. like a like an a very uncomfortable and bizarre yeah. cynicism underlying so much of like the current and maybe it's just like twitter memes and stuff but like there's such a callous reaction to the reactionaries of the right who burn political capital trying to keep like fertilized eggs from you know being terminated and stuff i i wonder if you land somewhere in that that same camp as as i do that like this is just this this muddy um marker of of a broader systemic issue that like you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are on like uh, other countries as far as abortion, but I know we um, are unique in that we we overrepresent um, per capita for abortions globally, um, and it's like insane numbers. Like it's clearly just uh, the majority convenience. Um, mm-hmm. We have extremely liberal timelines in most states. I'm from Connecticut. It's like. I could be aborted right now. I think my mom could just go. <laughs> um, oh my gosh! The governor would be I, I think totally. that, my understanding is that even compared to Western Europe, our our, our um, policies are fairly liberal yes. in the United States. Yeah, uh, which seems strange. Fairly, <laughs> some states allow for late term abortion, elective late term abortion. New York yeah. went out of its way to to codify that in law, as if to say, like, we're so woke, you can mm-hmm. go a nine month pregnancy yeah because because you wanna and like oh it's rare like okay cool yeah so i live in new mexico and we don't actually have we don't have a law it's basic abortion has basically been decriminalized here so we don't have any laws that protect abortion um they recently i think as of last year uh repealed the um the pre- Roe v. Wade uh, abortion prohibition law that was on the books um, here, but they don't have, like, we don't have a constitutional amendment protecting abortion. We don't even have a law that says abortion will be protected. Uh, It's not codified. How how are they defining abortion when they are doing these prohibitions? Because you had mentioned it earlier, too. Like, if anyone's medical chart uses the word abortion, that's an abortion? Or, like, are we talking like a DNC versus... Do, do, do you know offhand? Yeah, so this is this is actually a problem that that um, that I noticed after the overturn of Roe. Um, and actually, uh, I do want to say one thing uh, to your previous question. I believe that the abortion issue is a canary in the coal mine sort of issue. So if you're not familiar with that idiom, canary in the coal mine um, is the idea that uh, well. Canaries were, were used in coal mining to indicate whether there was toxic uh, gases that would kill a human being, right? So if the canary died, uh, you knew that tox- toxic gases were around and the coal miners would have to, to uh, evacuate. So I believe that abortion is a canary in the coal mine sort of issue. Uh, for example, one of the reasons why a woman might seek abortion is because she doesn't feel like she can afford uh, to actually go through with, you know, the, the uh, healthcare cost of pregnancy. Lots of people don't realize that insurance doesn't cover a whole heck of a lot. Um, private health insurance doesn't cover a whole heck of a lot when it comes to pregnancy. It can be very, very expensive. Well, that's an economics issue, right? Uh, when we talk about the cost of healthcare, there are reasons why it costs a whole lot. So rather than um, ridiculing a woman for what is essentially a market signal saying, hey, healthcare is too expensive. The pro-life side is just like, oh, you want to murder your baby. No, we should be looking at the cost of healthcare. Like women are sending a market signal saying this is too expensive. If I cannot bring new life into the world, that's too, it, it's too expensive. So I just want to make that point. Um, and the anarchists as, have a great, a great line there because it's almost entirely state-derived. 
Mm-hmm. Not as if yeah. we have some like radical free market and you know we just can't afford babies anymore. Yeah, there's there's actually a really great um, video, uh, animated video that was uh, based on an essay written by Roderick Long, uh, explaining how government fixed healthcare in the first place. So this is this was back during the industrial era, and basically doctors were upset that consumers were setting the price of healthcare. Shocker. Like, yes, this is why we want the free market because consumers set the price. Uh, we know this. Well, doctors were offended by that. So they went to the government. They're like, hey, do something about this. We deserve, you know, to be paid more. And that's how insurance companies and medical licensing came about. So literally, government fixed healthcare by making it more expensive on purpose. Um, and it's something I point to with my left leaning friends when they bring up the cost of healthcare. I say, look, the government caused this to begin with. <laughs> um, so we don't need awesome, more government. There's an awesome book. Uh, it's kind of obscure. I found on the, the Mises Library, I think, um, for my my bachelor's nursing capstone project, which I wrote on uh, abolishing <laughs> medical licensure, uh, occupation, mm-hmm. occupational licensure, which was a really popular position to take. Um, Richard Hamowy wrote, uh, the title is ridiculous. It's like medical the history of medical licensure from 1901 to 1974 or something. And it just documents um, with all the receipts and great citations of, of just the incestuousness of like the AMA and all these state boards. Yep. And it's just wild. It's a, worth, it's an, it's, it's insane. Yeah. I, 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 I'm going to have to look that up because that's, I think that's, that's very relevant um, to your question about how abortion is defined. So this is something that I figured out after the overturn of Roe, because you had um, you had a number of, of states with legislation, like uh, draft legislation that was almost identical in, in every state, which means it was drafted by some, you know, pro-life activist organization. Um, and then it was submitted out to a number of state you know, legislators who are, who are willing to submit it. So um, at any rate, as I read through it, uh, what I realized was that, um, well, first of all, the left and the right, when they talk about abortion, are not talking about the same thing. When the left talk, talks about abortion, they're talking about the end of a pregnancy. So how that pregnancy ends, uh, whether it's miscarriage or stillbirth, or, um, a, you know, a, a DNC or myth, mifepristone, the, the sorts of things. It's all abortion. It might be a spontaneous abortion or it might be intentional, but they have a very broad definition of the word. When the right talks about abortion, they are talking about something very specific. They are talking about a medication or procedure that initiate, initiates fetal demise. Intentional. Right? So, Um, So they're talking about two different things. The problem is, is that the way that the Republicans are going about trying to enact abortion prohibition is almost identical to the way um, gun control advocates would go about regulating or prohibiting guns, right? So they don't deal with the murder aspect. They deal with the goods and services aspect. And they say, okay, you can get a gun um, in only these circumstances, right? There are these exceptions to, to the rule and they have to have these regulations attached to it. They have to have these spec- spec- specifications. Well, if you look at the way the Republican uh, anti-abortion legislation is written, it's written in much the same way. Uh, you may not get an abortion procedure unless, you know, it, fa- it falls under one of these exceptions to the rule. Um, so how, how, how many years until we have to pay a $2,000 tax stamp for an abortion? Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's, You're it's so rather. Right. That's, a, that's a good analog. Yeah, it's, it's rather ridiculous. And I've pointed out to uh, conservative pro-lifers that when it comes to abortion, they are very socialist and they do not like that comparison. But it's true. Um, you know, when I talk about uh, there needs to be more options available um, for women with unplanned pregnancies, they're thinking, what's wrong with adoption, right? 
what's wrong with this one option? Well, that's the kind of thing that Bernie Sanders would say about healthcare. What's wrong with this one option? Um, so the way that the Republicans go about doing it is not, not good. And it's not going to be effective. Um, but one major thing is that they define, they define abortion differently from how the left defines it. I've come to an uncomfortable, but I think, uh, extremely rational conclusion um, as far as re abortion in an anarchist uh, utopia if, <laughs> if <laughs> such a thing exists and um, it could and it's that abortion uh, elective abortion will be um, present now first of all do, do you agree with that premise just generally I think that you are always going to have women with unwanted pregnancies. Right. Uh, that's never going to go away. Um, whether abortion is, or I should say the degree to which abortion is present, I think is going to depend very heavily on the market that's available to her. If the options available to her on the market, whatever they are, are safer and less expensive than an abortion. She's just, economics says, praxeology says she's not going to choose abortion. And actually we- That's like we've, the underlying- Yeah, we've, there's, there's, um, there's data to support um, the fact that when uh, the cost of an abortion is too high, women don't choose it. The other thing that um, they found is when a woman feels like her most basic needs are met. She will not choose an abortion. Um, so, you know, we address yeah, problems. Go ahead. Go ahead. My, well, I was my just going to. The thing is, like, these, these women are not coming up in, like, a normal culture. And they're, these moms are, like, being asked to raise moms, their kids by themselves in, like, single mother households with several kids and poor incomes. And, like, that's the. Well, uh, again, it's a canary in the coal mine issue. Like, yeah. okay, if you have a ton of single women who are pregnant, we should be asking the question, why? Well, you've got a ton of cr conservative Christians who are like, well, because they can't keep their legs shut. And it's like, really, that's the reason? Um, you know, I, <laughs> my, my own story, which I alluded to at the beginning, uh, has to do with being in an abusive relationship. And I didn't know I was in, a, in an abusive relationship while I was in it. That was 12 years long. Um, and what I learned after my divorce and after I started going through therapy and learning, you know, all the things that I needed to learn, one of the things that I learned was that um, the red flag signals for a toxic or potentially abusive relationship are completely predictable. You can learn these signals um, and avoid those sorts of relationships. And it occurred to me, you know, we have sex education in public schools. Nobody teaches our kids how to avoid toxic and abusive relationships. So again, economics problem, right? We need services, whatever. And I'm not talking about public services, but options available on the market, uh, whether it be curriculum or classes or whatever to educate young men and women, boy, teens, boys and girls, there's no, no reason why we can't teach our kids these things that says, hey, um, if a person is doing X, Y, or Z, that's toxic, that's very bad behavior, you don't want to get involved with this person. Or if you're doing this, you should stop because you're mistreating that person. There's absolutely no reason in the world why we can't be teaching people those things. And, um, so, you know, if the problem is, oh, you have a bunch of single mothers who are having to, you know, raise kids on their own, we should be asking, why are there single mothers? And if they're telling us at those, you know, at the abortion clinics, when they fill out the little survey about why they're having an abortion and they check off a box that says, I, you know, I'm in a bad relationship, we should believe them. Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's my thought on that. Yeah, I just, I, th I want, I think about these, these things as almost like externalities of a, this deeper 
like, yeah, the women are certainly in, in terrible relationships and that in, impacts the, the decision-making, uh, the casual like hookup s- culture world is I'm sure playing yeah. a, a part and like the free sex thing. I, I don't know if you listen to Dave Smith. I, I know, or I think I know that you're like vaguely familiar with him. You guys have mm-hmm. interacted in some respect. Um, but his his whole thing post Roe v Wade was was about that, and I, I think that there's something there. But like, there's this deeper seated loss of like com- communal human like humanness is the thing I always mm-hmm. like go back to. Um, yeah, and like, I, I don't if you, if you take every, all of these arguments to their logical conclusions. I, I don't imagine that like hunter gatherer societies were were having this debate because of like the extreme value, even if it was just like callous productivity of human life. Yeah. And like today, it's just like I don't know. You're just gonna take a a username I was gonna use or something. Like it, it, there's nothing to it, and it's really yeah. it's really sad. Well, even the uh, more reactionary responses from. Uh, the more extreme side of the per-choice, you know, side of this debate, which tends to be, you know, sort of in your face. I know this is a baby and I'm killing it and yay. Um, I actually see that as a trauma response. Um, And that's, you know, another thing that I learned post-divorce was about trauma and the impact on people and how that manifests in their behavior. And one of the ways trauma manifests or can manifest in somebody's behavior is by lashing out. And so um, even those women who are uh, being very extreme in their reactionary responses to the pro-life movement, uh, I see that as a cry for help and just a trauma response. And I think it makes a lot of sense uh, given all of the stories that have come out about abuse, especially abuse in the church. Uh, that's been a huge issue uh, that I don't think we should be, that I don't think Christians should be sweeping under the rug if we really want to address these issues, um, you know, address the abortion issue. We have to address these these other issues as well. There's, you know, they're not, they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, yeah as I said, a trauma responser, I think in some cases, just a troll. <laughs> a trolling <laughs> behavior, right? Well, there might be, there might be some of that. Yeah. Well, I, I say that just because I see similar things on the right and then the libertarians as well, but um, on different topics. But mm-hmm. so you've talked a little bit about um, kind of what what we may be doing wrong in, in the pro life movement or just as a culture, um, and that seems to also carry uh, forward to the, ty- the types of arguments that you're seeing um, pro lifers make, um, and so. Uh, I guess one question I might have for you is um, where do you think that these typical pro-life arguments fall short and what is it that that is different about the way you uh, argue uh, for a pro-life position um, that you think is superior? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I would say where the pro-life movement, um, and I call it the the conventional pro-life movement, Mm -hmm. where the conventional pro-life movement falls short is by not taking seriously the reasons women give for having abortions. Um, I, you know, just having a bit, I I don't have an economics degree. I have a basic understanding of Austrian theory, right? Read Henry Hazlitt um, and, uh, you know, some Robert Murphy and some Ludwig von Mises. It's not in depth, right? But I can look at uh, the reasons that women give for seeking abortions. And I can say, this is, these are market signals, right? Now, when I tell a conservative pro-lifer that, you know, that explanation, these, these are market signals, we can do something about this. They think that I'm giving credence to that woman who sought abortion to begin with. And that's a mistake, right? Um, it's, First of all, I'm not giving any sort of credence to the solution that they came to, which is to have an abortion. But I am giving credence to the fact that women are economic agents. They are making decisions about their own bodies. They do have agency. And what they are 
seeing in their own lives when it comes to the prospect of bringing new life into this world is they see a number of threats. And, uh, you know, what makes women women is our ability to have babies. Uh, it makes absolute sense that a woman's instinct about whether or not it's safe to bring a baby into the world uh, is legitimate, mm. right? And the reasons that she gives for feeling like it's not safe are legitimate reasons. Now, again, not saying the solution is go have an abortion, but those are legit reasons for not feeling like it's safe to bring a baby into the world. And so Republicans conservatives um, don't they 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 put their blinders on when it comes to uh, evaluating the reasons why why women seek abortion and that's a huge mistake um, not just because it disconnects them from the ability to have compassion for a woman who has sought an abortion um, but it disconnects them from an opportunity to actually provide um, for those those needs in the marketplace uh, and that's where it's really it's really necessary. While even in an, in a anarchist society, I would say abortion should be technically illegal. It's not going to be the legal prohibition that ends abortion. It's going to be the market response that ends abortion. It's kind of interesting because it seems like what conservatives sort of it is like. Well, it's like um, you know when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So. When you're a statist, every, any solution that's not a status solution doesn't seem like a solution. Right. Um, and and um, so, yeah, they, they want to attach blame and, and, and find a way to sort of send the state after that person. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I can see that. Um, um, and so I think it, it seems like what, one thing that you're trying to sort of do in general is, is kind of value the, the concerns and the rights of the mother as well. Um, so... Um, I want to mention briefly the, the, the debate that you had with uh, Walter Block, where he, he makes what you what was been called an evictionist argument, which, mm -hmm. is, which is an interesting um, position on abortion because it tries to recognize both what the pro-life sa side says and the pro-choice side says. Mm -hmm. so the, it recognizes that the pro-lifers are correct, that what we're dealing with here is a human being. Mm -hmm. um, but it says, nevertheless, <laughs> um, the, 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 the woman has bodily autonomy. And so an evictionist argument um, would be something more like, um, well, you know, um, especially from a like Walter Block's kind of more libertarian perspective, um, you know, yeah, a fetus has a right to her own life, um, but she doesn't have a right to her mother's body because the mother was the first person to homestead, uh, which is one of those kind of libertarian terms, her body, and uh, no one has a right to use what belongs to someone else. And so as a result, Block would argue that a, a pregnant woman has a right to expel a fetus at any time, even if that expulsion results in the, in the baby's death. So, um, you know, Block seems to be sort of trying to recognize the rights of both. Um, so wh wh where does your sort of attempt to recognize both the, the rights and, and, and concerns of both parties in this, how does it differ? Why does it reach a different conclusion than, than Block uh, reaches? Yeah. So um, I would say two things. So, you know, Block acknowledges something from the pro-life side, which is that, you know, um, a human is a human and has rights from the moment of conception. Um, I am a staunch advocate of a woman's bodily autonomy and agency. And um, I'd say that one major difference between Block and I is that I do not believe that uh, the rights of mother and offspring are at odds with one another. Hmm. Um, so he tries to solve the problem by compromise, right? That's what he calls it. It's a, it's a principled compromise. Um, so, uh, you know, he would say that you only have, that, that eviction may only result in fetal death, death if it's um, before viability, right? So he and I would actually agree post viability. Um, the problem with his argument is that every single human being comes into existence in the same way. And every single analogy that, he, that he's offered doesn't work because the, um, the analogy is about an already existing human being being on somebody else's property, right? But in the case 
of uh, new life, right? You have uh, conception, which is the resulting consequence of an action previously taken by the mother and, you know, and, and another man, right? The father, whomever that is. And if that's the case, libertarianism is not a kind of philosophy that allows people to be free of the consequences of their actions. It, on the contrary, says we're responsible for the consequences of our actions. We're free to choose. We're not free from the consequences of our choices. And so, uh, number one, this is the way that all human beings come into new life. So this is actually a situation where we don't apply an analog or attempt to apply an analogous situation. This is a situation where we should be deriving normative law from. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's no other situation where a human being just emerges um, into existence uh, without any without any choice. Like there's no analogy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we should be deriving normative law from it. And if we believe that human rights are inherent in our humanity, given to us by no one, then that means that the woman's rights and her offspring's rights cannot be at odds with one another. They must be reconciled. Uh, um, and in that case, we... So, 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 so if, I, if I could stop you to summarize, it sort of sounds like kind of what you're saying is um, if we're if rights derive from nature, we're talking sort of like a natural rights perspective, this mm -hmm. is most natural <laughs> um, yeah. process that, that, that life gives us. And so um, yeah. we, we assume that there, there couldn't be a conflict because otherwise you can't actually have natural rights at all. Right. In fact, I think some of the, the lingering rights questions that we have, uh, common property is, is one of them, would actually be answered by working out how the, uh, how the woman's rights and, and the fetus's rights actually work together. Um, there's a lot of questions out there that are sort of left in the abstract because we don't know how to deal with it. Well, if this is the place from which we derive natural law, then it's setting the precedent. It's not, it's not some place where we're trying to apply something that's sort of analogous. Um, that's, that's a backwards way of, of addressing it. Now, with that said, this, uh, this hasn't been done. This reconciling women's rights and, and the rights of offspring has not been done. Um, and, you know, I would say that's what, that's the thing that I'm trying to do with, with my, with my, uh, my research and what I want to submit for peer review is actually reconciling those two. Cause I don't believe you can have a consistent theory of human rights where man's rights are absolute but women's and offspring's rights are relative to one another. That just doesn't make mm. sense. That's not a consistent theory. That sounds like a really interesting project. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that was the thing you mentioned at the beginning that, that uh, people have the opportunity to sort of uh, participate in um, through the monthly yeah. membership. You can, they can kind of see what you're doing and, and your work on that project. Yes. Right. At mirrorliberty.com slash membership. Yeah. Um, uh, can, can I interject for a sec? No, absolutely not, John. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, one of the one of the like fundamental issues that I think gets lost in the evictionist argument, or um, that I <clears throat> I appreciate that you like in the debate with Walter, which you did excellent, and um, there, there's this like this giant elephant in the room from my perspective, which is as a guy, I will never you know bear a child. Um, However, women's entire bodies and like their sexual appeal from a man's perspective is their fertility and reproductive system. Um, mm -hmm. And women are born with all of the little ovum that become fertile eggs and eventually fetuses that we can or cannot abort. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about evictionism as this um, parasitic use Let's let's take non-consensual insemination uh, off the table for just a moment. Any mm -hmm. consensual sex that leads to pregnancy is like as natural a usage of a woman's body as 
can be, uh, e mm -hmm. even more so than sex itself, uh, consensual yeah. sex. So I, I like w men and women, w women's greatest gift to humanity um, is motherhood. And, and I think where we really missed the ball is like talking about that, celebrating motherhood is this this incredibly empowering thing like cool yeah you're a ceo at 40 and now you're like looking back and wishing maybe um you know you did go through with the surrogacy or whatever i don't know but like there, there's so much loss in women that don't have children and um because they can't and then women who elect not to find themselves at like you know 35 wondering like if it's you know too late and i, I just don't think we're grappling with the fact that like women are are made whether you're a christian or not made from their moms to make children and it can't, yeah. you can't evict a child from its like natural coherent vessel yeah. that's a goofy way to like sure. very libertarian <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. um well, it, I, it, it let me say it let me say this about that because one of the things that i brought up in the debate was that uh woman owns a means of production. She owns the ultimate means mm -hmm. of production, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're willing to think about, see, the thing is, is that for at least, I'm not going to say most of human history, but most of, we'll say the classical liberal uh, view of human history. So since the enlightenment, at least, women are not thought of as economic agents, right? They, um, you know, you use the word vessel. Uh, I know what you mean by that, but there's been uh, conservative Christians who have referred sure. to woman as the weaker vessel, which I think is uh, an erroneous interpretation of scripture. Um, and that's sort of, uh, it's, it's minimizing what exactly she is, right? It's calling her an incubator basically. And the thing about a woman owning the ultimate means of, of production is that everything, everything, all the choices that she's making are directly or indirectly connected to her reproduction. And this is true throughout her whole life, right? So when she's developing, right, she's from, from infant to adulthood, she's developing the capacity to have babies, like physically, psychologically, emotionally, um, if her parent, you know, if her parents are doing her their their jobs, she should be learning socially, you know, how to how to care for people, um, how to care for babies, right? Uh, most teen girls end up becoming babysitters, right? Making money as babysitters, um, and then you have young adulthood that is focused on. Um, not just, you know, making a life for yourself. So getting an education, being able to, you know, pay the bills and, and have a place to live, but, um, also, you know, the, the dating aspect, learning about relationships, um, being able to, uh, see which is going to be a good match for you. And then there's, you know, assuming you get married, there's motherhood, right? And there's the actual direct, okay, now I'm making decisions. Um, I need, you know, this amount of income in, in place, we need this many rooms in our house, we need, you know, this sort of furniture, we need, you know, all sorts of things. Those are all economic decisions, right? But she's making those based on the fact that, that she is producing a new human. And then you have, um, you know, after, after that, you have uh, your, your children are growing up, becoming adults. So your job is to help them become independent, help them become adults, right? Now you're starting to, to pass on what you learned back here. That's still all indirectly related to your reproduction because that's, that's your progeny. And even as a grandmother, right? When you're, when you're old, you're no longer fertile, but as a grandmother, you're still, um, you're still doing the motherly thing for your own grandchildren, or maybe, um, you know, other kids in your community, in your church, that sort of thing. So, when we look at the bigger picture, every decision that she makes is directly or indirectly related. In fact, what we're starting to learn right now is that 
um, a woman's health and wellness is directly related to her fertility. Her fertility is actually a signal that there might be other health issues going on wrong with her body. And if she's in tune with her fertility, she can identify things like cancer in her body. So one of the problems with the way the conservative pro-life movement has treated women is that she's, she's just an incubator. She's just a mother. She doesn't make all of these decisions, right? It's the husband who makes these de decisions. It's the husband who, who, um, you know, who leads and, and, and does all these things. And certainly there's a place for masculinity and husbands and, and fathers and all that, but we don't want to minimize the role that women play in this. And so I think probably what we're missing from our culture is not just a respect for motherhood, but a respect for women as economic agents making decisions about their body, when they're going to have kids, who she's choosing as a mate, who she's not choosing as a mate, right? All of those things go into her bodily autonomy and, and, and agency. And if we took that seriously, for example, we might teach her how to avoid a toxic or abusive relationship, right? We might teach her how to actually understand her fertility and track those things so that she can stay on top of that. We might teach her how to um, choose a job that she isn't going to um, end up regretting because she has to sacrifice motherhood for that. Or maybe we end up respecting the women who do end up choosing to be childless, even if they are a minority. So, uh, you know, I think the, the scope mm -hmm. needs to be broadened a little bit or quite a bit when it comes to a woman's role in her yeah. bodily autonomy and agency. Yeah, and I, I, want, I want to apologize. I, I think I was doing the very thing that I, I take so much issue with, which was painting in like black and white binaries, broad strokes. I, I, you're absolutely correct that like the minority of women who are choosing not to be, you know, mothers are, um, you know, a distinct minority. And yet um, you read about these issues in, in, uh, central and western europe of of um often economic or cultural issues of of women who are not you know even considering childbearing until they're in their 30s or 40s mm -hmm. that are um you know ceos who are writing times op-eds about how they're trying to like post hoc justify a life of decisions of avoiding uh motherhood just to find themselves feeling unfulfilled and so it's it's not as if um women are this like single useful variable and and you know i if that's i hope that's not the, the point i yeah. was coming off to no i didn't i i didn't get that sense from you but i felt like it needs to be said because i do know that yeah. um you know there are a lot of libertarians i would say especially in you know the the mises groups will say who recognize the necessity of men and women they recognize the necessity of masculinity and femininity and they want to draw that out um but i think it's important to point out from a woman's perspective how that can be done wrong and it has been done wrong in the past you know if we if we recognize women as economic agents as having bodily autonomy and agency as being able and capable of making decisions about um you know, about her body, about when she's going to have kids, if she's going to have kids. And we teach her that those are her decisions, that there are trade-offs. You know, she might choose to take a career path and she might come to regret that, right? It's a trade-off and she needs to consider that. If we're honest with women about what their options are, then they're better equipped to make those decisions. And you'll probably have women who still choose to be motherless, but won't experience so much regret. Um, and that's perfectly okay. We can be okay with that and still have right. a society that recognizes the necessity for, for masculinity and femininity. Uh, um, you know, the, the feminist movement really screwed things up in that way, um, by just trying to eliminate those, those distinctions. Yeah. Uh, didn't... The waters about informed yeah. consent for motherlessness or. Yeah.
as you were talking about kind of women as economic agents and, and how the sort of conservative pro-lifers don't rec recognize that, it's it's kind of occurred to me that there's been, I think, a lot of naivete, um, even in like kind of previous eras where where you did have a much you know stronger argument that there was that you had a patriarchy in place and that women had lesser rights. Um, we still, I think, we assume that that means that the relationship between men and women was simple and not this sort of complex negotiation, um, which you know. It, 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 this is kind of a more negative example, but I think of like Macbeth, right? Where you have this, you know, Macbeth's, you know, wife, Lady Macbeth, who's doesn't really technically have any political power, but still has quite a bit of power because of the influence that she wields, you know, on her husband. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a more negative example, but I think it is obviously more complex, um, you know, the, the role that women have in these relationships. On the other side though, um, you know, I think that a lot of these kind of pro-abortion arguments um, much like progressive arguments about the sexual revolution, the transgender revolution, they're rooted in kind of a rejection of our nature, like an alienation mm -hmm. even from our nature. Mm -hmm. um, and usually often because we can sort of have some artificial medical intervention to change something like the pill or abortion or yeah. hormones or whatever. Um, and so it's essentially an attempt to redefine our nature. We don't want to, we don't want to acknowledge what we are. We want to be something different. And right. I think maybe some of some, because we can do that now, um, it gives women a lot more options. And I think a lot of women can benefit from that, but I think some women will also find that maybe the sort of artificial thing that we've constructed, <laughs> the social yeah. reality, um, it could can actually be an alienation from how we're designed or evolved or however you want to describe that, um, that could actually make us unhappy, right, in the long run. Yeah. Um, and, and, and just there's an example I always think about. I read a book from a a pro-abortion philosopher named Eileen McDonough. Um, and she, there's a quote in it where she talks about the puritanical notion that sex leads to pregnancy that we dispelled <laughs> with in the sexual revolution. Because the Puritans um, came right? up with that. <laughs> yeah. it, it, but, but her argument is we live in a new era now. We've got the pill, abort, you know, sex, there's no organic relationship now between sex and pregnancy because we cut it off. Yeah, um, I think and so now that that's a bygone era's notion. Yeah. I think that's what I was trying, I, I'm driving at the essence of is this, like, this is a unity between man and women yeah. and mm -hmm. man and, and woman. And um, anything that, that takes away from that and removes even, even the, the, the term economic agency, I don't know what our timeline looks like. I don't want to, I don't want to like further the conversation if you guys got to go, but the, the term economic agent almost seems like a purposeful uh, tactic on your part, as far as like the Mises crowd goes, um, mm -hmm. which, which I appreciate because yeah, us neckbeards really only speak one language. But um, <laughs> the the idea that like a, a woman's place in society, like it's just the fundamental perpetuation of our species, is is anything less than than miraculous, and that we we need to both value that and recognize that. Um, like there's this this weird tension between like the the freedom of sexuality in today's day and age and and the, mm -hmm. the like push push button nature of of every uh, solution to problems including abortion where you can like just show up at some some clinic and like they'll just take care of that problem for you and like yeah. you know we we've we've reduced everything down to these these really um, like anti-human decision-making processes. And like, yeah, mm -hmm. I think, I think you did a really good job of describing that Cody. Like it's, it's precisely that, that like, that's what seems to be at issue here is like man and woman, regardless of your, you know, I know we're all Christians yeah. here, but like, I don't, I don't think it has to be a Christian argument per se. Yeah. There, 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 there is definitely a, a version of, of kind of, I think what we're saying, John, this kind of far right, um, kind of new right, you know, these, uh, well, John's gone, but I'll keep talking anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> like the, 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 kind of the, 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 uh, the, the incel neck beards who sort of, <laughs> um, you know, talk about, um, you know, nativism and, and, you know, these, these important distinctions between men and women that they sort of, uh, you know, make very concrete. Mm -hmm. Um, and anyway, um, which I, well, I, I certainly don't want to make, uh, the, yeah. that, right. I, I want to, I want to make a comment, uh, though about, sort of this this transition that that women went through with women's rights so 
the major part of the women's rights movement happened with the second wave. And what happened with that was that women went from um, having their legal rights recognition wrapped up in their husband mm. uh, or their father, um, which literally that ended in 1971 with a Supreme Court decision called mm. Reed versus Reed, uh, which is where the, the Supreme Court decided that a woman's uh, legal rights were not bound up in her husband. So that ended in 1971. This is this is still fresh in human history. Um, but it went from a woman's rights um, or the guarantor of the of women's rights being the husband or the father, and it went immediately over to the state being the guarantor of women's mm. rights. And what, as libertarians, what we know is that we are the guarantor of our own rights because our rights are inherent. But, uh, and while individual women may have intuitively picked up on this, uh, certain individual women have uh, intuitively picked up on this, by and large, women were never taught that they were the guarantor of their own rights and that they mm. could make these decisions for themselves. And I think that's really important to understand because when you talk about uh, the feminist movement, the feminist movement treats women as though they're victims of nature, as though their most powerful feature is the greatest detriment to them. And mm -hmm. that's, that's a flaw. But the, on sure. the conservative side, women are still victims. They're the weaker vessel, right? And they need to be protected. And that turns into an enfeebling, infantilizing kind of thing that is also not healthy for, for women. So what libertarianism actually brings to the table is a recognition that a woman is a a human in her own right has all of the the agency and the ability um, to to be her own person in her own right, and that she is the guarantor of her own rights, and that she uh, the decisions that she makes about her body and uh, who she decides to have relationships with are legitimate. And I want to add one more thing. Because Jordan Peterson has, has brought this up, and I think it's a very valid point. Um, he's talked about how uh, human women, so this is distinct from female animals, human women are the sex selectors. They're the ones that say yes or no to sex. And we know this because if she says no, and a man does it anyway, he's raping her. It's a crime. We know this. Um, so she's the sex selector which means, and women have a great effect on men, right? If a man is interested in a particular woman, he's going to go out of his way to impress her. Well, if she understands this about men, women actually have the power to improve society just based in, the, in her decision in whom she's going to have sex with or not. Right. Yeah. So that's a very powerful position. And uh, if women understood this, which most women don't, because we're not taught that we're the guarantors of our own rights and that bodily autonomy and agency only ex extends to abortion. Um, but if we understood that, we would actually be improving or contributing to improving society because it's offering a motivation for men to improve upon themselves as well. It's an upward spiral. Spiral. Instead, what we have is a downward spiral. Right? Uh, women think that their only exercise of autonomy, uh, bodily autonomy, and agency is to have an abortion. Well, that's just mm -hmm. that's just creating the downward spiral, and we're living that right now. Well, I was going to say another um, uh, it makes me think of another philosopher and, and psychologist who predates Jordan Peterson on this, uh, Dave Chappelle, uh, made it. <laughs> uh, uh, he had a similar bit uh, said more crudely um, mm -hmm. about um, uh, I, won't, I won't use the exact language that he used, um, but basically he and he <laughs> you could argue that it's uh, objectifying in some way, but it's similar to these these, these arguments about economics that we've talked about. Um, that if 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 sex were a stock, it would be plummeting because it's been devalued because it's been given away too mm. easily. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, okay. So um, I don't want to keep you too too long. So we, we really need to maybe just address the political aspect of this because I'd imagine sure. there are people listening saying, "Okay, so we know you're an anarchist. We know you don't believe in the state. 
how can you meaningfully be uh, pro-life then? Because usually what, when, we, when we meet somebody who says abortion's wrong, but I, I don't want the state to do anything about it, we call that person pro-choice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, um, exactly. Why are you not pro-choice? Um, and, um, you know, can society meaningfully address abortion from a pro-life perspective without using the tool of the state? Yeah. So this is a great question. Um, when I talk to minarchists about this, usually it involves uh, explaining to them things about criminal justice reform and how, you know, where our, our current system actually doesn't produce recidivism. It doesn't produce re uh, deterrence. It's ineffective, right? Um, now, I would say that if we're going to be pro-life the and actually expect to end abortion, the stronger mode of civil governance is anarchist or, or polycentric. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because with the monopoly state, even at a minarchist level, our only option is trial and error without existing government. And the problem with that, and we've seen this in American history, the problem with that is that there's no uh, conceivable way of keeping the state limited. And so you might get some bad decision makers in there that grow the government over the course of four years, and it never goes back down, right? With polycentric law, you uh, it's, it's not a society that is absent civil governance, right? I would say Christian anarchists, um, and I'll just, I'm going to, I'm going to plug a new podcast that I'm doing called uh, Re the Reformed Libertarians podcast, where we're going to be talking about uh, Christian anarchism and how this, this actually pans out, not just from a theological perspective, but in, uh, but a philosophical perspective as well. So in polycentric law, you still have uh magistrates, judges, they're private, that, you know, these are, these are people who run their own businesses as uh, dispute uh, resolution or adjudicators, right? Um, and the good decisions that come out of those, those, um, you know, those adjudicators become law, right? Um, so what happens is, is if we are able to um, adjudicate the issue of abortion, right? Obviously, we're, we're assuming that everybody has agreed in, you know, in a given area that uh, abortion is a violation of the non-aggression principle. But then you have all of these, these situations that come up, these nuances, these things that, that John talked about. Miscarriage. I don't think that miscarriage qualifies as, a, as, um, as abortion, but you might have a situation where, you know, somebody wants to actually try that, actually adjudicate that. So the benefit to, to an anarchist view, a polycentric view, is that that trial and error that, that we inevitably have to go through as we create law happens much more quickly and uh, much more effectively. We end up getting, producing better law, lower cost, and because uh, agencies are having to compete on the market, they're having to produce the best law, right? Otherwise, they go out of business. So I actually think that a pro-life anarchist position is the most ideal when it comes to working out these, these issues um, in, in practice. And it can be done. It absolutely can be done. Uh, um, so, the, the, the two things that come to my mind, because you, you kind of spoke about um, how there, there might have to be sort of an agreement in, in a jurisdiction or in an area uh, on this issue before you can really meaningfully address it, which mm -hmm. I suppose is somewhat true in our system. You have to have at least sort of a majority agreement about this or, or at least a few Supreme Court or a majority of Supreme Court justices at the very least. Yeah. Um, so there's that question. Um, you know, the, the second question, though, is, you know, when I think about private police, I'm thinking of uh, police who are are working for money, essentially, um, um, that their customers pay them directly. So they're not there's not this kind of weird go between. You have the public officials who sort of pay the, mm -hmm. the salary of the police, and um, you know I could imagine 
um, you know, uh, a pregnant woman who has a contract with private police, I can't imagine a fetus uh, creating a contact contract with the private police. Right. Uh, so what, what, what motivation or what, um, what economic incentive would there be for private police to protect the rights of, uh, of a fetus? Okay, so here's the thing. Police don't protect rights, right? They can't. <laughs> um, in order for governance, whether public or private, to protect, or when we say protect, what we're really saying is prevent crime, it has to become authoritarian, right? So it can't do that. Uh, um, when it comes to, you know, the, the, the fetus can't speak for itself, right? So what would happen, uh, like practically speaking, how this would play out is a family member who finds out that, you know, their sister or their mother or their, um, you know, their wife, whatever, uh, had an abortion. It's number one incumbent upon them to produce evidence, right? And uh, so they would have to they would have to actually produce the evidence, and that's really difficult to do. If if I'm honest, um, you know, a woman who takes uh, the abortion pill, unless you know that she's actually put that pill in her mouth and swallowed it, it looks like a miscarriage, right? you can't tell that she's had an abortion. So is it possible that there would be abortions that take place that go unadjudicated? Yeah, that's why we want the market. That's why we want these these options available to her so that when she's staring herself in the mirror uh, in her bathroom one day, trying to decide whether or not to swallow that pill or keep a baby that she's scared to death um, that she won't be able to raise, right? We want her to see that the dangerous, more expensive option is to take that pill. Um, now, let's say a family actually does produce the evidence. They would take it to one of these private courts, right, um, and adjudicate it. Now, there's any number of ways, and, and uh, anarchist theorists have, have all talked about the different ways that you would actually get both parties to come to court. Um, I believe that both parties, you could get both parties to come to court. Um, I'm of the opinion that what would happen in that adjudication process is that something more along the lines of restorative justice would take place. I don't know if you guys have heard of restorative justice. Um, I did an episode about restorative justice uh, last month, I think it was. Um, but I think if you ask most people, should we cage this woman or put this woman to death because she had an abortion, I think most people would say no, right? Most people would say, we, we would never do that, right? We wanna make sure this doesn't happen again. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think a restorative justice uh, avenue would, would be taken. Um, but I think it's completely feasible and realistic that you can adjudicate this. It would be people who have evidence. Um, I think it would be more likely fam family members. You know, the the new Texas state law that says you can, you know, if you get wind of a woman who's um, uh, who's had an abortion, you can civilly sue her. There's a lower threshold for um, for the uh, oh, what's it called? I forget the term. Anyways, the the evidence that you have to provide doesn't have to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt, <clears throat> just clear and convincing evidence. And then you get, you know, whatever the, the amount is, I think it's $10,000 or something like that. Like that's close, but not quite. Right. Um, I don't think that you would actually, I don't think it would play out like that in a polycentric, polycentric legal order. What you would have is a motivation um, not just on the part of the parties involved, but especially on the part of the people providing that adjudication service is um, something that actually produces deterrence, something that actually reduces recidivism. And um, by all accounts, that's a restorative justice model. And so I don't think you would have women being thrown in prison. I don't think you would have women being handed down the death penalty. You might have a few communities that act like that, but I don't think they would survive for very long because women just wouldn't go there. Um, and 
So I think it's completely feasible. I think in order for people to imagine it, they really have to reimagine what criminal justice is, how that plays out, what, you know, one of the things that I'm, uh, that I've said multiple times is that moral outrage is not justice and it's not a substitute for justice. And I think people inherently understand that. But this idea that we throw a book at a woman who's done something out of, uh, you know, desperation because she's in a bad relationship or she can't, you know, she, she's poor, uh, is not something that we would, as human beings, would typically do. Can we still adjudicate it? Yep, we can still adjudicate it. Um, can we create law that says abortion is wrong? We don't want this to be a part of our society. Yep, we can do that. Can we create an environment through the the market that uh, increases the options available so that the trade off is too expensive, too dangerous to have an abortion. Yep, we can do that too. So I actually think that an anarchist or polycentric legal order is ideal for ending the practice of abortion. And, and one example that comes to my mind, economic incentives to not abort would shift in anarchism. So adoption becomes easier for one thing because we have all these sort of things in the way. But not only does it become easier, it actually could become, um, you know, financially, I don't want to say lucrative because it makes it sound a little uh, mercenary, but, you know, <laughs> So a woman who has a baby that she doesn't want to keep and she doesn't want to raise, mm -hmm. um, th there wouldn't be any barriers for uh, potential adoptees to, to give her financial support to yeah. keep that baby, which right now that's a, that's a really kind of a complicated legal area because essentially you're buying people. Um, right. Well, treated by the law. <laughs> I mean, again, going back to economic terms, she's the owner of a means of production. She uh, women are going to um, specialize in motherhood. Right. And there are going to be mother and there are going to be women who don't specialize in motherhood. Um, and that's OK. And you're going to have accidents that happen and unplanned pregnancies that happen. If we have an understanding in the market that there are women out there who have specialized in motherhood, it, it becomes a no brainer. Adoption becomes a no brainer. Um, it's it's so much easier. Um and you know who knows there might be there there might be other options. Um, I don't think that uh, artificial womb technology is is out of the question. I think that that's a <laughs> pardon the pun viable solution to a woman who doesn't want to carry a baby to term to give it up to a, for adoption. Huh. Um, so you know there's what we need is more options available, and not just that, but reducing the cost of motherhood. You know, I am uh, I mentioned it at the beginning that I'm a single uh, single mother of three. I work from home and I homeschool my kids, but I could not do that without inexpensive laptop technology. You know, I can buy my kids a laptop for 200 bucks a piece and they can do schoolwork um, provided by the market, either paid or free. Most of their homeschooling has been provided for free because I'm resourceful. But um, that reduction in cost has allowed me to homeschool my kids. And mm -hmm. so uh, when I talk about options on the market, I'm not just talking about um, switching out abortion for something else. I'm talking about reducing the cost of motherhood um, because that makes a huge difference. And, you know, there's a reason why women are the primary consumers. It's because we're the ones who are making the decisions about what's best for our families and our, and our homes. Um, so it makes, economically, it makes absolute sense that women are in the position that they're in and why we need uh, a free market. Um, women, have, women have the most to lose from uh, abandoning free market principles and adopting socialism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, John, go ahead. Thanks, Cody. I, I'm thinking as you're speaking, and it's kind of it's shocking to me that it's never been so frank as, as this conversation. But the the inherent cost, regardless, like, you know, I don't know what the the rates are of sociopathy, but assuming zero moms getting abortions or sociopaths, like the the cost. Um, of making that decision. I, I have three children of my own. I, you know, my, my wife is a, an incredible mom, but mm. it's not as if like there, there is a, a, a loss of, of value as, I, as we were talking about earlier, 
and I think that it makes it it, it softens the um, the decision in some ways. But like there there's nothing. Just as you you have a hard time steering the the bulk of young you know toddler girls from dolls um, and you know flexing that early like a innate motherly reflex, it's the same with an abortion like like the gravitas of, of that decision. And so mm-hmm. it, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny like I, I think if we asserted that more and just said like this isn't we're we're taking for granted that this is just some like even the procedure itself is not i mean if it's the procedure is not a a, a, a low barrier or you know small obstacle yeah. to hurdle so um yeah which just so where, well, i'm sorry where do you get your information on on expressed reasons for abortion i've never heard of that being like aggregated uh the gut matcher institute provides it okay um <laughs> pro lifers Pro-lifers don't want to, uh, uh-huh. again, want to, they don't want to give any credence, so they wouldn't take gut matter seriously. But I have I see no reason to not take gut, gut matter seriously. But yeah, that's where I've gotten it from. Okay. Um, Which is, the, 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 that's the, the research wing of Planned, Planned Parenthood. I, I've heard it pronounced Guttmacher, but I, I don't know. If, 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 uh, it might be. Yeah. One of the but, that, yeah. but that actually comes directly from Planned Parenthood, is, is my understanding. Well, and I think, you know, the thing is, is that there's not really, in my mind, good reason to deny the research that Gutmacher, oh, yeah. however, you know, th- th- that they put out. Because, you know, when I said that women seeking abortions will um, choose to not have an abortion if their most basic needs are met. Um, I'm admittedly twisting Cutmatcher's words on that just a little bit. The thing that they say, or the thing that they point out in their studies, is that under democratic administrations, the uh, abortion rate goes down. Well, why would that be? Well, they say um, that it's because welfare uh, programs are increased, right? Food stamps, Medicaid, those those sorts of things are are increased under democratic administrations and they're rolled back under republican administrations now they use that as an argument for why we need welfare systems right why we need food stamps why we need medicaid and that sort of thing um but if we're actually looking at it from a praxeological standpoint what we're looking at is mom's most basic needs are being met she's getting food she's getting health care she has you know money for rent um, those are her most basic needs. And so if we look at it from that perspective, then we know that uh, it's not just a matter of, is she getting a government handout? It's, can she actually provide for her child? And if she feels that, then she's more likely to keep her baby. Good. Well, there's a lot more we could, I think, talk about. We've, already, we've gone on for a bit now, and I don't want to keep you all night. Um, so I just want to say thank you, Carrie, for being willing to do this um mirrorliberty.com is where people should go uh you also have um more than one podcast there's the mirror liberty podcast right yeah and you're starting another one so yeah the um dare to think is the name of the mirror liberty podcast you can google either one uh but if you go to mirrorliberty.com you'll find all of my stuff including the dare to think podcast the new podcast the new podcast is called uh reformed libertarians you can find that uh at reformedlibertarians.com we actually just officially launched on november 11th and we're doing a giveaway for people who are new subscribers so you can go to reformedlibertarians.com until November 21st um, to, to sign up for that. Um, but that's going to be, I'm really excited about that podcast because we're going to be diving pretty deep into theology and church history. And, um, and also, of course, uh, the, the, the philosophy uh, be- behind libertarianism, behind a- anarchism and Austrian economic theory and, and really bringing those things together. So um, I'm really excited about it. Our first sort of series is on a number of uh, historical reform theologians who expressed um, advocacy for a Christian political resistance, uh, um, a, an actual doctrine of political resistance. So um, very exciting. So you can go to either one. If you want to support my research and you want to see 
um, you know, everything that I've talked about tonight um, gets submitted for peer review, you can go to my website and support me as a monthly member. And also, you also do work with the Libertarian Christian Institute, and mm-hmm. I've heard you on the, their podcast from time to time as well. Yeah, yep. I'm on awesome. staff with on staff with them. <laughs>